Good afternoon. Welcome to the Engineering and Construction Sustainability and Energy webinar series. Uh, today we are speaking on energy modeling. Um, our host and presenter is Jennifer Ramirez. She's out in Japan right now. She's one of our up-and-coming uh, architects in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, she does designs and master plans and area development plans uh, in conjunction with energy modeling and eco charrettes and things like that. So she's going to be bringing a wealth of information to us and insight into the energy modeling process. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and it will be posted on our private webinar channel, uh, which is accessible through our uh, Mercy site, our sustainability, sustainability and energy website, uh, which a link is down here in the web links box, as well as a link uh, to our past web webinar channel. If you'd like learning units or CEUs uh, for attending this webinar, you can obtain them by going to the Mercy site and downloading a quiz. The quizzes are in groups of five webinars. Uh, fill those out with your answers and email them to the address on the screen, s underscore e webinar at usace.army.mil. And presuming your answers are correct, you will get um, credit. Uh, if you send your AIA number, uh, we'll register them with AIA directly. So, with that, I'll now open up the presentation and turn it over to Jennifer. Good morning from Japan. This is Jennifer speaking. Um, in today's webinar, we will be discussing the requirements of ECB 2014-17, how to implement the requirements and review a case study developed by Seattle District. So as a part of today's goals and objectives, the outcome of this webinar is that each person should be able to analyze the ECB 2014 and why it is being required and the origins of the requirements, identify the level of effort involved of energy modeling at different phases of design, and how to apply and develop an effective and dynamic energy modeling team. And here's today's outline. The question our design team was faced with was the simple fact that 70% of decisions associated with environmental impacts are made during the first 10% of the design process. This fact impacts the design, the development, and the future maintenance of a building. In essence, the life of the building will be determined through a few simple decisions at the beginning of a project. Leading up to the publication of the ECB 2014-17, Several laws and policies were enacted. This ECB provides a methodology to encouraging compliance with the requirements set forth by the policies and laws as listed in this slide. Now we're going to look at the ECB and what it requires. The effective date of the ECB 2014-17 are that projects for projects FY15 and beyond. Hopefully your design teams are already implementing these requirements, which we will be discussing in more detail shortly. The minimum qualifications for the project set at a minimum limitations of energy modeling, which will be expected to be performed. The purpose of the ECB 2014-17 is to create the methodology for compliance of the existing energy regulations while utilizing the ASHRAE standard requirements. And you'll note that I've specifically pulled out 90.1 Appendix G requirements, which really is um, where energy modeling requirements are laid out. This policy is enacted at all phases of design. This means that energy modeling validation compliance shall be conducted with the complexity of that design phase. We'll discuss more of that here shortly as well. The deliverable requirements is encouraging the PDT to include their energy modeling throughout the design analysis and the already existing requirements. So why is this important? Why is ECB 2014-17 exist? Um, so in LEED and environmental design, there's typically a saying about the triple bottom line regarding environment, economy, and the ecology. So this is kind of a sustainability buzzword, which is typically followed up with, there is no silver bullet. What this graph is showing and what this means is that for every project, there is an innate equilibrium in which the project is cost effective and energy efficient, but cannot be prescriptively described for each project. And this diagram shows that equilibrium that we strive for. 
The ECB breaks down the energy modeling process into phases, with each phase related to a level of energy modeling that is required. We will discuss what this means for each phase and how and what is expected. At a planning phase of design, there is a finite of energy modeling that can be constructively done. What is truly important at this phase is that the goal and the problem are established and what the performance targets and the basic site considerations are. At the early phase of design, having owner contribution is particularly helpful to gain insight to the customer's needs and help to define the goals and objectives. And this case study that we'll be looking at here shortly will identify each of these phases and how it was implemented. At a schematic level of design, the expectation is that the design problem has been developed and the potential solutions can be generated. As design decisions are developed and energy modeling assists in a quantitative analysis rather than a qualitative analysis, an approach towards an evaluating uh, design concepts can become developed. At the interim design phase, which for the designers on here, that would typically mean a 65% design, um, is a more detailed energy modeling. And this is typically where the mechanical engineer would come into the forefront of the project or your professional engineer. The design at this point has been decided, and the development of the construction documents is well underway. At the final design phase, benchmarking energy modeling and performance validation is the last and most detailed version of energy modeling. As you have seen, energy modeling is a progressive implementation, one in which is not expected to have all the information at the beginning of the project, and the energy modeling requirements mirror the level of detail the project is at. So stepping back, to understand how a building will perform, you will need to understand how the environment performs, as the building is subject to the impact of its environment. It is typical that this is done prior to the planning phase, so that all parties invested understand both the challenges and opportunities that each environment provides. And at Seattle, we developed a um, what we consider a sustainability shrimp prep package, and this would include all of this basic information of weather data, regional sustainability solutions, localized sustainability solutions, and in some cases, depending on the customer's needs, an architectural theme based on each area development plan or master plan. There are two distinct degrees of energy modeling that can be described at as conceptual and whole building simulation energy modeling. Typically, architects would take the primary role in the conceptual phase, and mechanical engineers would take the lead on the whole building energy modeling phase. This is based on the amount of information at the phase of design, as previously discussed. So based on this information, conceptual energy modeling would be implied for the planning phase and the schematic phase. And at the interim and final phases, a whole building energy simulation would be conducted. Oftentimes I've heard from PDTs, um, an energy modeling isn't my responsibility, so why should I be involved? An energy model is only as good as the information that it is input from the team. And if the team isn't sharing information, then the energy modeling will not reflect a realistic performance. This is in part why performance validation is conducted so that designers can learn and see if there are flaws either in the energy modeling or the building and corrections are made. This is particularly important why the owner is also listed on this slide. Because at the early phases of design, it's critical that the owner contributes their information and their requirements as well. 
So I wanted to include a reference sheet in case others would like to learn more about energy modeling. This is also some of the reference material I used for the previous slides. Um, the Department of Energy has published a great deal of information on energy modeling, and um, the, the additional links on here are what I would consider to be exceptionally helpful and accurate. So when you're considering energy modeling objectives, keep the end goal in mind as a design tool to validate design decisions. The traditional path of energy modeling would be that a mechanical engineer would wait until after the interim phase to start the energy modeling because that's when enough information has been generated to complete an energy model. However, if you've waited this long, you've lost the potential to create and maximize the design performance, such as some of the few items that are noted here, like siding or orientation, those are all things that could be done at the planning phase of design. Whereas, you know, renewable energies, um, you know, solar shading, the depth of that solar shading may need to wait until the schematic or even interim phases of design. So now we're going to be looking at a case study. This case study was done by Seattle District. I was a part of the team. And it was for a battalion headquarters. It's one of the only projects to ever be approved for an energy waiver by the Center of Standardization for Battalion Headquarters. It was based um, by a joint base Lewis-McChord. And this initiative was brought by the customer because they were seeking for a more energy efficient design. The design premise was a fixed building site with many floor plan options. The team composition was a full in-house design team. And I see that some of our design team members are on the attendance today. And shout out to them for such a great project. This project was a design bid build um, with uh, in-house doing the full design and construction documents. So what you see here, the design was considered a quantitative analysis approach developing the floor plans towards the regionalized climate zone of Joint Base Lewis-McChord. So in the previous slide where you saw the weather data in the eco -Charet, we utilized that information even before coming into this slide right here. We designed the five distinct different floor plan options um, that all met the Army criteria and analyzed the energy performance. At this point, we met, our, met with our stakeholders, which included the owner, um, all of the design team members and determined that the best floor plan that met our customers' needs. Now in this case, you notice that you know there's there's quite a few more that could have had more energy efficiency. However, based on the customer's requirements and maximizing the site, we ended up going with option number three. We conducted a detailed energy modeling at the interim phase, utilizing a 3D energy modeling software performance. Due to the duration of this um, project, we had actually validated and started with energy modeling software in Carrier HAP, Train Trace, and utilized IES VE Pro. For IES VE Pro, because it's such a new software, we maximized this for the natural ventilation um, solar and internal heat gains and daylighting analysis. At this point, this is still a fairly complicated software and um, we're still um, learning more information about it. But those three aspects we utilize in IES VE Pro. So what you see here is the result of a rigorous energy validation is proven by the metrics shown on this slide a 53% reduction over the baseline energy model. This success was due to the rigorous design approach in which the whole team, including the customer, was involved for the duration of the project. We followed the guidelines of ECB 2014-17 and were able to achieve a successful project. You'll note that there was approximately a 53% energy reduction or 52% energy reduction from the baseline. And this was all approached um, due to the iterative design phases, but also uh, option, the baseline was considered 
um, the first floor plan, which was a square, and the last option on the right was the third on that uh, floor plan option that you saw previously. So in this presentation, we haven't discussed the process of how to go about this. And if you'd like more information about that, you can look at the Sustainability Charette's QMS report that was developed by myself and Lisa Hansen at Seattle District. This presentation ended up going a little bit quicker than I had previously expected. But um, that is the end of my presentation. I'd really like to okay, open it up I've to discussion up, uh, now. The Q&A box on the right-hand side. Um, at the bottom of that, of that uh, white column there, you'll see a text entry box, uh, the uh, participants that is. Uh, type your questions in there and they will appear uh, only to me above and I will consolidate uh, redundant questions and read them aloud for the sake of the recording and uh, Jennifer will answer verbally. Uh, a couple things I want to point out is you saw some of the uh, links on the previous slides. I've also put <clears throat> a couple of them um, down here in the web links box. Uh, the energy modeling with that open studio. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, and also I've got a copy of the presentation and a copy of the ECB 2014-17 uh, down in the file share box. Uh, I'll leave this uh, window open a little bit after we uh, finish here uh, to give people an opportunity to click on those and click the Save to My Computer button uh, to download them uh, if they would like that. Um, so uh, we have one question um, that mentions that they saw that the heating and, and transportation were primary areas of uh, reduction. Uh, how are they reduced? Is trans transportation, I guess? Let's go back. Um, let's go Not back to that slide. I'm sorry. So that's actually the, that should say, and it is the ventilation, yeah. Um, so how we did the heating, that was mainly air pumps, but it's also because we were maximizing the efficiency of the floor plate itself. Um, so it, it, it had it a lot to do with the air pumps that we were designing into the building. And then the ventilation, we were... That's through, through walls. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. So that's the ventilation. Right, right. So on this building we used, uh, for the exterior walls, we were at a R25, I believe, for the walls. And um, we were using air pumps for the heating. And we were also using displaced ventilation for the cooling which was a great source of energy reduction as well. Because at this point, we were um, trying to avoid using Going back air to your, uh, your eco uh, what uh, changes have you seen come out of the recommendations from those eco charrettes in terms of things that uh, adapted to the site or orientation aspects? Or uh, how, how did that inform the design, if you can think of any examples? So what's really great about sustainability charrettes is um, the way I like to describe it is it's incurring, encouraging constructive play for engineers. And a lot of times we become very mission focused. And creativity isn't necessarily generated from just strictly mission focused projects. So what sustainability charrettes allows you to do is to have um, like dynamic play where you get to run through scenarios and sketch and um, look at design options. And it's very much a traditional charrette where you uh, hash out ideas, you throw up sticky notes on the wall, you figure out what works in comparison to the regulations and the requirements, and marry up all of those design options with the customer's requirements. It's, it's become a much more fluid process now that Seattle has done around 26 of them. But um, that QMS really reflects a great deal of Okay. Great many Are there years um, of development. certain technologies or building design strategies that you see come up again and again as being uh, the most effective in reducing energy uses? Usage.
Well, in Seattle specifically, um, we're lucky because we're in a temperate climate. So we get to use items like natural ventilation. And that's, that's been a real big help. And you'll notice that on this building, you see that it's, it was placed as south facing with um, an overhang on the south side and on the north side, windows that opened up for ventilation. And uh, it naturally cooled the space. Also, I think probably everybody on this webinar has realized that air pumps are a great efficient way of um, heating a space. And that's consistently coming up. Uh, I will say that in terms of the building envelope, especially now that I'm located in Japan, I've noticed that it's, it's extremely important to right size your building. So not necessarily over insulating or under insulating, but going back to that concept of an equilibrium and trying to find and trying to find that perfect sweet spot. Um, ASHRAE 90.1 uh, Appendix G tells you how to do it. And then it's really ASHRAE like 189.1 that's going to set the metrics. And those metrics are really determined based on what they believe the minimum standard is. And that's already setting you in the right spot for gearing towards that equilibrium. Um, and from there, it's a matter of using that energy modeling to tweak and get get to just the right place in the building. And typically, that's going to mean that the architect, the mechanical engineer, the electrical engineer um, all need to work in conjunction with each other. So it's not necessarily the information being passed from one person to another, but it becomes a circle, like that previous yeah, diagram, where information is flowing between everybody oh, sorry, all the time. And that kind of goes back to, oh, sorry. Oh, that just uh, encourages the concept of integrated design, which ASHRAE 189.1 has now required us to use. And I believe okay. future policies for well, A couple for, uh, clarification questions that uh, came in. Also um, be encouraging one that. is probably some confusions that I started by saying transmit, transportation. I believe it means um, transmission losses, right, through, through the wall, the energy flow, through windows and walls. And, um, and, you, and it says, um, and how was that energy loss reduced? Yes, thank you. Um, so we used spray foam within the wall cavities. We actually sprayed an inch um, within the wall cavity itself. And then uh, we, we were also using a rigorous um, sealing method on the windows. So this was, I would say that in Seattle District, we really strived to um, do detailing to its finest on the building envelope. And Kyle Shaw, who's on this presentation, is a technical architect with a fantastic expertise in how to achieve that detailing. Um, and this project really strove to maximize the efficiency of the building envelope itself. So that, that's one way that we achieved it. We, we were trying to reduce the overall cost of the project, so we didn't spray foam the entire okay. uh, uh, And somebody else asked if you could elaborate on an what an air pump is or how it's being used. Um, that's a heating source in which a, actually I'm not a mechanical engineer, so I can't fully go into great detail on how to describe it. <laughs> um, but I, I can say that it's, it's a heating source that is electric based. I believe Kato is on, on the line. Oh, he might I be can, able uh, to um, describe that in more detail as well. There if they have, um they have that capability. Uh, let's see. Uh, in the meantime, oh. <laughs> not, yeah, not to call you out, Kato. Sorry about that. Um, if you don't, in the meantime, um, <laughs> If you don't choose see, to we have do a that question. Way. What were the sure. process loads that were uh, were, were the process loads found to be at least twenty five percent of the total energy modeled? Process loads, I think, is another term for plug loads, the user loads, basically.
go back. Now, air pump is that another word for heat pump? I have a visual here, really quick. Oh, okay. So it's a heat pump that an air pump that pumps air from a heat pump. Yes. Kind of sorts. Oh, like the inverter heat pumps or something like that, probably. I'll we'll have to get some mechanical yes. engineers involved. It... Yes. And if I'm a little inaccurate oh, on my right. uh, technical verbiage, I, I do apologize. It's in the afternoon here. Four twenty-eight in the morning. Oh, DC for me. Okay, so the previous question about plug loads. Um, part of this is a standard requirement by Appendix G and ASHRAE ninety point so there's a preset amount of plug loads, and that's why you don't necessarily see it reducing, because it's something that has to be considered standard. Um, and if you're going to change it, I believe ASHRAE requires some exemplary calculations as part of it. I hope that answers the first okay. question. It all goes back to ASHRAE. And, uh, who runs the actual energy modeling program? Is that something the mechanical engineer does, or the architect, or? It depends. It depends on the phase of design. So when you consider the conceptual energy model, so the conceptual energy model that's something that the architects would typically do. And um, and this is what mechanical engineers would consider squishy energy modeling, in which it's really about massing, orientation, trying to figure out the building footprint, which you saw as that initial five floor plan options in the case study. And that's something that architects would do. And it would typically be in a more conceptual-based software. For that case study, we use Green Building Studio. And Green Building Studio is um, it's a very basic energy modeling software. In all honesty, most mechanical engineers, um, you know, they, they have a lot of questions about it. But its real purpose is just to determine form. And then the whole building simulation energy modeling, which really kind of kickstarts at the iterum phase of design, is owned by the mechanical engineers. And at that point, the mechanical engineers are developing their own Carrier HAP or Train Trace model or IES, whichever software um, is utilized. There's there's probably uh, the previous email on energy modeling. I think showed like 10 or 15 different software applications you can use, and they're all published by the Department of Energy as what software you is recommended and what the benefits are. But that whole building uh, simulation energy modeling is owned by the mechanical engineers. And in all honesty, the architects should touch it. You know, that's not our expertise. Um, but they're modeling in conjunction with the requirements of ASHRAE 90.1 Appendix G. And people like the owner and the electrical engineer and architect are all feeding information for okay. the mechanical um, engineer. I have another question. Um, there's some comments model. that uh, they can't get into the QMS. And if they could uh, file share some information here. Uh, or perhaps so we can follow up after the fact with uh, an email or something like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Christine Clapp is in the uh, global address book. If you want to send her a note, or of course your email is uh, on the screen there. Uh, I don't know how long it take us to dig stuff out of QMS and try to upload it on this site, because um, I don't think I can get into QMS either. Um, Yeah, they've been having some problems with QMS recently, so I'll follow up with Lisa Hansen and confirm. I will say that um, this was a fairly robust QMS, and there's 19 or 20 pages involved in it. It actually takes parts of the weather data, and um, it, it literally has examples for every phase of the design. So it's, it's fairly... Okay. 
Okay. Um, uh, I don't see any more questions then. I do see a thank you very much for presenting this webinar. Great job. Um, and if there are no more questions coming in, then uh, I'd like to thank everybody and especially uh, Jennifer for presenting today. Thank everybody for participating. And I'll leave this um, window open, the meeting space here open, so that people can download these file shares and, and check out these uh, web links on the bottom. Um, I will. Uh,